Break. Welcome back from the break, um, and welcome to our closing session. As you can see, this is going to be a really interesting session. I'm very, I'm looking very forward to it. Um, before we get to Ari and to my test of how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> I have a couple of things I wanted to, to say. Um, the first is just a remark on Bob Quinn's session, and just this concept of how we take things from good to great is something I think really powerful to think about. And um, especially when you think about that last bullet point that he had, which was good to great um, organization culture. And so as you think about you know, that uh, arc or that possibility, uh, we do have a lot of um, uh, power to kind of make that happen as positive leaders uh, sitting in this room today. And so the word that we've, a, lot, a word people have been using has been, has been uh, the word agency, that we have the agency to kind of step into this position, the agency to, to kind of make this happen. So uh, agency can be a little bit of an academic word. So what do we mean by that? Basically what we mean is that having agency means that you have a sense of the ability to make choices, the ability to kind of take action on something uh, without being told or, or without having to be given permission to do that. Like you kind of own the ability of the option, the opportunity to kind of make that choice for yourself. And so I think we all, as positive leaders, have this opportunity, this agency, to take our conversations about organization culture from good to great, or even from great to fabulous or fantastic. <laughs> um, so a um, couple other things. Um, so I'm not a, a University of Michigan graduate, but because I come here a lot, I, I, have, I have swag. And so uh, <laughs> uh, I was wearing one of my Michigan t-shirts in San Francisco on the underground one day, and this guy kept looking at me, and I thought, you know, what's going on? Is he, does he think I'm cute or something? Or <laughs> uh, but we, we got off the train at about the same time, and he said, go blue. <laughs> And I had to think, oh, oh, Michigan, I'm wearing the Michigan t-shirt, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I have this, a similar experience with Zingerman's, actually, where I have some uh, colleagues back in San Francisco who went to graduate school here, and um, they told me about Zingerman's for years and about the brownies, the other delicious things that you can get from Zingerman's. And so now, uh, when I come back here, I'm given the task of buying something and bringing it back to California for my Michigan friends to enjoy and to reminisce on all the good times that they've had here. So, oh, uh, yes, yes, well. <laughs> Yes, I think they like that my agency in kind of getting it and bringing it directly to them. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, Sigurdman's was founded here in Ann Arbor in 1982, and so uh, it's been here for a long time. It's quite an institution for this community. And uh, Zing Train, the kind of arm of Sigurdman's that, that now offers training uh, on how to t actually how to help organizations go from good to great uh, has been around since 1994. And RA has uh, written a number of books and they give like lots and lots and lots of uh, workshops and, and retreats and et cetera to support people in their positive leadership practices. Uh, I have a couple of his books, they're fabulous, he's fabulous. Anyone that I've ever met who's worked at Zingerman's is amazing. They're, they're all positive leaders. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward, and we all are looking forward to this session. Um, all right, we'll be signing books and selling books just outside of the auditorium after we're done uh, this afternoon. So just please know that if you have some questions for him or want to see the variety of books that, that they offer, those will be available. And so now it's the test. <laughs> Uh, well, so what Annie doesn't know is I actually took German in college, so. <laughs> so I know how to say R.A. Weinzweig. <laughs> so please, welcome Ari. <laughs> that was, that was a no-brainer no if you took German. Okay. <clears throat> In his essay, Politics Within Limits, philosopher, playwright, poet, and anarchist Paul Goodman wrote that having a vocation is somewhat of a miracle, like falling in love and it works out. 
His supposition fits me to a T. Thirty or so years ago, I fell in love with my work. This book is about how that love story came to happen. I'm also in full agreement with what an elderly French farmer told food writer Patricia Wells, as quoted in her fine book, A Food Lover's Guide to France. We love our work, he said. We don't count our hours. We think our work has value. Those two quotes, one from a well-known New York intellectual, the other from an unnamed Provencal peasant, sum things up for me. The wonders of hard work, rather than wondering why we have to work hard, never counting hours while mindfully making every hour count, the power of a poet and the poetry of power used in positive ways, working out in both senses of the word, making a difference in the world, anarchist insights, old-fashioned farming, and falling in love. All are essential elements in what's made my life so seriously rewarding. They are also, I believe, a big part of what's made Zingerman's so successful. The basic premise of this book and of this talk today is that if we want to run a great business, then the place to start is inside ourselves. So Chris uh, tasked me with, <laughs> how do you create a great life, not just a great business? And I'm, I'm like, so is that like an all day? <laughs> <laughs> So the problem with doing these is I'm like, I realize like I'm like a long distance runner and then they tell you to run the thousand meter and it's like, and then like at Mackinac, I'm at the Mackinac Policy Conference and I get 15 minutes. I'm like, that's like a marathon person and you told them to run a hundred yard dash. Like, is it, so I got way more to tell y'all than we got time for. <laughs> but uh, my, my hope today really is, uh, just to get you thinking and to leave you probably with more questions and food for thought than I'm going to give you answers. And really just to share with you things that have made a difference in my life and that make it legit for me to actually write that and mean it. Okay. Um, before I do that, two uh, ads, not for our business, but for two nonprofits and things coming up. Paul Jones knows what one of them is. Uh, so one of them is, if you, who here likes to learn, by the way? About 70% of you. <laughs> Some of you didn't know what to do today and you saw it in current magazine that you could come here or something. Okay, so, so two ads. Uh, one is just uh, at, f what's, I'm gonna end for this. at five o'clock at the Labadee Collection and we're gonna be on the sixth floor of the Graduate Library, two blocks to the north. I'm gonna do another talk. This is like the little extra gift that you learned about this morning, a free bonus, what at Zingerman's, when it's our service training we call going the extra mile. This one's on anarchism in business. And some of you think I'm joking, but I'm not. And if you wanna hear the actual historical, intellectual and philosophical roots of every good thing you've been hearing over the last two days, from about people who went to jail and often died for the stuff that everybody here rightfully is putting forward. This is where it came, a lot of it came from. And it was, if you think that, I mean, I'm not taking credit and I love all what everybody's saying about autonomy and self-organized work teams and getting rid of command and control are old news in, in a good way. So it's pretty interesting. I used to study up there. Anyway, the other one has nothing to do with anarchism, but it's sort of the positive business conference of pork. And it's a, it's a fundraiser for Southern Foodways Alliance, and it's called Camp Bacon, and it's coming up three weeks from today. And it's just like today, only there's a lot of bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and we have like, ten, just like today, 10 great speakers, social excellence in bacon. We got all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, offices with bacon, by the way. No, so it is really all about bacon. It's a fun, fundraiser for Southern Foodways Alliance, which in all seriousness, I think is the nonprofit that's very much like positive organizational scholarship in the culinary world. So that's ZingermansCampBacon.com. Now, on to what I'm actually here for, uh, which is to share some stuff with you today about what has helped my life to be better. Uh, I will say it's a little intimidating to follow all of these amazing speakers because these are all people whose books I've read and been studying, but I'm going to get up here because I'm also afraid all the time, which I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to get up here and do it to it anyways. So uh, I don't want to do a lot of Zingerman's history because we have a really short window today, and a lot of you I already know and you've already heard our history. 
Uh, but just for context, we did start in 1982. Uh, I did study the anarchists while I was in school, hence this connection coming full circle has been a very fascinating subject for me. How many people were there in 1982? Yeah, so it's kind of funny. We've been in business. It's actually not just a long time, but 37 years that we've been in business, uh, which is now twice as long as some of our newest employees have been alive. <laughs> and uh, I'm working on a food book, and I've been working on a little history for context in there, and so I've been doing some homework on what it was like in 1982. So just for those of you who weren't there, some of you will go like, oh yeah, this feels like yesterday, and some of you are like, wow, that really happened? <laughs> So just FYI, 1982, I realized like we're, we're now as many years from when we opened the deli in 1982 as we were in 1982 when we opened from the end of World War II. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of crazy. Uh, interest rates in 1982, Bob Quinn remembers, were about 18%. Unemployment was 11%. Gas cost less than a dollar, and the brand new, released in 1981, Ford Escort was the biggest selling car <laughs> in the country. This is just to give you context. The top films that year were Gandhi, Officer and Gentleman, and Chariots of Fire. I feel like they just came out yesterday. I loved them. Some of you are like, wow, I saw that on Netflix. I've never watched anything on Netflix. I don't even know how to get it, and I'm not joking. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not joking. Uh, Rock the Casbah came out that, that year. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it's still a great song. And by the way, I just discovered there's a guy named Rashid Taha, an Algerian, who passed away a few years ago, but he did an incredible Arabic version of Rock the Casbah. This is not the subject of my talk, but, <laughs> but you should look it up if you like The Clash, because it's really killer. Uh, phones, by the way, at that time were all on cords. <laughs> And there were phone booths all over town, and pretty much anybody who had anything always carried coins with them, because God forbid you got stuck somewhere and you couldn't get home or whatever, and you didn't have a coin, and you were basically turned into a panhandler, even if you had $20 in your pocket, because you couldn't call your significant other to pick you up when your car broke down. So this is just to give you some context. By the way, I didn't know this, some of you, Roger might, but emoticons were invented at the year we opened. Does anybody know where? I wouldn't have known this. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There you go. Don't say you didn't learn anything. But anyway, that's, that's what was going on when Paul and I opened the deli in that little building. That little building, by the way, was built in 1902. Uh, kind of wild. Fast forwarding today, we started with two employees. Today we have about 700. We hire about 100, uh, 350 more at the holidays. So if you want to experience what the work is like, <laughs> come on down. Or if you have a teenager you want to get rid of, <laughs> they'll, they listen to us. <laughs> and, and, you, and you could have them back at the end. <laughs> and they can ship Chris's friends some food. OK. So what, I, what, what really today, though, so that's how we got going. I don't want to do the whole Zingerman's business story, because you could read about it, Wayne. Uh, did I see Wayne here? There you are. Well, how many case studies? Three case studies now? Four. Up to four. We're up to four case studies. I should get one of those little things on my football helmet for how many case studies have been done about us. But anyway, what I really want to talk about today, and y'all have workbooks, no PowerPoint. That's the only slide you're getting. You're getting paper, pens, old school. So, uh, oh yeah, so you have this little Candyland version of us. But what I want to talk about today is really about the internal work And it's internal work that I've been through and I'm still going through. And it's stuff that, uh, totally honestly, I could not have told you an iota about when we opened in 1982. What I read you from part three of the book about vocation and falling in love with one's work, certainly my intent was sort of aligned with that, but I had like zero vocabulary. So everything really I'm going to share with you today is stuff I've learned a lot through learning, as Bob said, from failure. <laughs> and then trying to recover with some modicum of grace and figure out what went wrong and how to make things work. Sound all right? 
Okay, by the way, uh, today, if you don't already know me, is meant as the beginning of a relationship, not the end. I like the conversations, as Bob was helping you with before. My email is ari at zingermans.com, and my cards are out on the table. Just don't email me while I'm talking, because it freaks me out. <laughs> and I know that, because I give my email out like on stage to 10,000 people, and then every once in a while, somebody would go, like, I'm listening to you now, and I'm like, you're kind of... <laughs> You're kind of creeping me out. Let's. So now I just tell you, don't do it. And if, at 4:15, you can email me, whatever. But hold off for a minute. Okay. Okay. So on page three in your workbook, there's a uh, neater drawing of this little chart that I have up here. You have heard the word beliefs like all day today. And now I'm going to tell you what I learned about beliefs. So clearly, I did not need to come here or start studying in order to learn about the word beliefs. Like everybody in fourth grade or third grade and above knows the word beliefs. However, the reality is up until about five years ago, four years ago, I really never thought about the importance of beliefs in the context of the work that we were doing and what its value was. Okay. Now, I'd already written a bunch of books. I was already teaching stuff. It's not like I was clueless. It was not like I wasn't paying attention. It just never really registered on me. And what registered on me was one day when I was reading a, a Bob and Judith Wright's book, Transformed, which I would recommend. And I don't know what page it's on. I don't remember. But in there was this little self-fulfilling belief cycle. Uh, Bob Wright wrote the foreword for the book I just read from. And in the back, in the end notes, you can learn about my life a little more departs hardly anybody knows of because he wrote an end note and how I know him and we'll leave that for another talk. But anyway, Bob can't remember where he learned this cycle, so I don't know who to give ultimate credit to, but I give it to him because that's where I learned it. I'm going to teach it quickly to you. It kind of blew my mind. It underlies everything Bob just talked about and that you've been hearing over the last two days. Uh, so are you ready? Here we go. Some of you have heard it before if you've heard me speak. So we all, it turns out, have beliefs. You've heard a lot about beliefs about leadership, beliefs about fear, beliefs about all sorts of stuff, but we also have beliefs about what's appropriate attire, beliefs about what a cup of coffee costs, beliefs about bacon, beliefs about anarchists. I'm going to show you that most of your beliefs about anarchism are misplaced. No, I am, because the commonly held belief is chaos and violence and killing is completely the opposite. <laughs> So we all have beliefs about everything. Based on what we believe, we take action. Literally, every action you and I take, other than if I throw a rock at your head and you duck, which is instinctive, other than that, every action, including coming here today, is based on what you believe, literally. Based on your actions, the people around you start to form their own beliefs. Based on their beliefs, they take action. And then here's what blew my mind, 95% of the time, their action reinforces the original belief. That's why it's called a self-fulfilling belief cycle. Now, Bob and the others have been saying this. This is just a visual graphic that kind of grabbed me because I started to realize this was going on in my life all day long everywhere I went. It's a self-fulfilling belief cycle. Let me give you two very quick examples, and then we'll jump ahead. Let's just say you work in an organization, none of yours, or you wouldn't be here, but an organization where the leader believes training is a waste of time. I'm going to talk fast, by the way, so we could fit a lot in. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So let's say you work in an organization where the leader believes training is a waste of time. What will she or he do? It's not right. They're all like, hmm. <laughs> you don't have to do a study to answer this. No training. Very good. See, you're, you're, don't be afraid. Or be afraid and answer anyway. There you go. Okay. So no training. What will the people who work there believe? Training. No future. What's the point? What kind of work will they do? Crappy. Everywhere I teach this, somebody goes crappy. It's really funny. Okay. <laughs> crappy work, and the CEO goes, thank God we didn't waste any money on training. Look how incompetent this staff is. <laughs> okay. Flip the, flip the belief around. Now you have a leader like you that believes training is a fabulous idea. What do you do? Tons of training. So I was teaching this in Portland, Maine a year or something ago, and Mara from Zing Train, who's out there at the book table, was sitting in the audience. She's heard me talk before, so I said this, and then she like went through and counted all the internal classes we have. And at the time, we had 71 internal classes. It's gone up since then. 71 internal classes for our staff. Now it's up to like 80. What do they start to believe about work? Yeah, what's the future look like? Hopeful. 
What kind of work do they do? The kind Chris was talking about, and we go, man, this training's killer. We ought to really up our training budget. Okay, the sad irony is it's exactly the same employees in both situations. All that's different is the belief. If you believe positive organizational work won't work, what will you do? Nothing. <laughs> if you don't do anything with the material, what will the people who are your colleagues believe about it? There's no point, it's just a bunch of academic mumbo jumbo. What will they do about it? Nothing, even worse, they'll probably talk cynically about it, what we call skunking. Then nothing will change and you go, see, I knew it was no good. Okay, this is legit. Do you understand where this is going? Okay, one other, by the way, countries go to war over this, and that, I wish that was not the case. But this is really what's going on. Countries are going to war because somebody has a belief, and it's a self-fulfilling cycle, and it just goes on and on, and when the cycles clash, they clash in, in, in combat, for real. Okay, one other thing here, and then I'm gonna move into some of the key beliefs that have changed, that made it possible for me to talk about my life as vocation. Right here, there's a filter. Okay, we all have it. If you're a researcher, it's called cognitive bias, but I didn't know that until after I started teaching it. Somebody, somebody who knew better talked to, to me about it. Anyways, here's what cognitive bias means. It means that we all filter out all the information that does not support what we already believe, and we take in the information and allow in the information that supports what we believe. And if you're a high achiever, which almost all of you already are, then we actually go out and find the information by ordering more books or YouTube videos or TED Talks to support what we already believed. <laughs> like, dude, you have found so much evidence over the last two days to prove that positive organizational scholarship works. It's incredible. <laughs> and the cool thing is, I agree with you. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So who's heard the saying, I'll believe it when I see it? Only a third of you? These are not, these are not fake questions, y'all. <laughs> and I can remember, by the way, so when somebody asked me how this conference was, I'm gonna go, only a third of them had heard the saying, I can believe it when I see it. Okay, I would like you to cross it out because it's totally wrong. Make a little line in your head or do whatever you gotta do with your phone to make it go away. It should be the opposite. What, 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 what ought to be? Yeah, when you change your beliefs, things look really different. If you change what you believe, everything will start to look different. Why? Because you allow in information that you wouldn't have put in before. I'm gonna give you a very entertaining but accurate canine example. Anybody besides me have dogs? A lot of you. More of you have dogs than heard the saying. <laughs> we don't do marketing studies. I just ask these questions and then that's how I learn. All due respect to the marketing department, Eric, wherever you went. Okay, so. So, uh, a lot of you know I had a dog, a, a corgi named Jellybean for 17 years. Uh, some of you saw me uh, with, and her running uh, down Clark Road where we live. Uh, somebody stopped me yesterday and said, stop running on Clark, you're gonna get run over. And I'm like, I know, my girlfriend tells me every day. Uh, anyway, Jellybean passed away, it's gonna be four years ago in three weeks, and it sucks if anybody's had their dog die. Anyway, uh, now we do a fundraiser for, in her memory for Safe House, because uh, we live right near there, which is the shelter uh, for women and children in abusive settings. So we made something positive out of her passing. But anyway, six months later, my girlfriend Tammy got us a new corgi puppy who we named Bean Sprout from Jelly Bean. <laughs> and Sprout's a really cute corgi puppy, and she loves Tammy, and she's love, great, we love her. Anyway, one day, she's, I don't know, four or five months old, Tammy takes the broom out of the closet and starts sweeping, and Sprout goes totally ballistic, right? So being how I was raised, you know, I'm stereotyping, but male, American, whatever, I tried logic. Sprouty, it's okay, it's just a broom. <laughs> that didn't work. But because I, was, because I was working on this belief stuff, I was like, holy cow. See, to you and me, it's the most obvious thing in the world. Tammy sweeping the floor, what's the big deal? But to a little corgi puppy, what does it look like? It looks like this long thing with scary bristles got a hold of your owner and no matter how she moves, <laughs> it won't let go. <laughs> when you change what you believe, 
everything looks a whole lot different. Let me give you one other one that I just realized, no joke, took me two years to figure this one out. So now we have four dogs, two corgis and then two rescues from Jordan. Uh, that's a whole longer story that I don't have time for is the negative dog culture in, in, uh, in Jordan. But anyways, so now we live kind of up on a hill. And uh, so with big windows looking down the hill. And so when the UPS trucks come, it's, we're like a block in from the road. So you don't need to have dogs to know. What do the dogs do? Bark. So again, I try logic. Like you guys, I ordered it. <laughs> That didn't work either. And then one day I realized, like, totally, like, here's what the dogs are thinking. Because see, if you just change what you believe, it all looks different. The dogs are like, danger's coming. These humans are completely clueless. Look, they don't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> and Sprout, who's still like the leader of the four of them, she's like, this is totally working. Not one of these guys ever got in. <laughs> because, because dogs, like humans, confuse Correlation with causation. She's thinking, let's just bark louder. We'll seal the deal. <laughs> when you change what you believe, things look really different. Is this making sense? OK, so with this context, I started to look at beliefs as the root system of our lives. Why? Because you don't see them. But everything that comes up above the, I like agriculture, we work with food. Everything that comes up above the surface is 100% correlated to the belief system underneath. That's why beliefs and culture are so closely related. And I started to look at culture as the soil. Because if you plant something in unhealthy soil, it doesn't grow. Beliefs are the root system. What happens if you clip a weed at the surface line? Look, you all knew that. <laughs> If you don't change the belief, the behavior won't change. This is why, with all due respect, and I'm super engaged in diversity and all the work around that, and I'm a big believer, but if you just get people to stop saying the bad words, they don't change their beliefs, the behavior won't change. And this is why the, the negativity still comes out when people are under pressure in the middle of a hockey game in a fight. They just go right back to what they actually believed all along. They just stop saying the words. OK, so if we don't change our beliefs, things aren't going to really change. Where do beliefs come from, by the way? And the answer is not Amazon. <laughs> from your past. So it's, here's the key. Beliefs are not genetic. Beliefs are not genetic. Beliefs are all learned. It's all learned. Can you change beliefs? Yes. Can you make anybody change beliefs? No. <laughs> if you doubt me, look at politics. Nobody changes their beliefs unless they decide they're going to change their beliefs. Patty uh, Poppy this morning told some very nice stories, as did Scott, about changing their beliefs. When things happen that are uncorrelated or incongruent with what's going on in your past, whatever, you start to change your beliefs. I could do a whole two-day seminar on this. But the point is, if we don't change our beliefs, what do we know about the future in its relation to the present? It's going to keep going the same. Not changing your beliefs in business and in life is basically like you're in a, traffic in a traffic circle in a roundabout, and you're trying to get out, but you just keep going around and around, and then you go faster and faster trying to get out and getting madder and madder that you're not making any headway. And by the way, I'm not a scientist, but what will eventually happen if you go faster and faster and faster in a traffic circle? You're going to crash. <laughs> OK. so. On the next page are some of the beliefs that I want to share with you that have had a huge impact on my life. How did I learn about these? In many ways, because I crashed. <laughs> you know, nothing hugely dramatic by the world's standards, but have crashes in our lives. And until we all know, until the pain gets high enough, whether that's organizational pain, social pain, or personal pain, until the pain gets high enough, we generally don't change our beliefs. <laughs> so if people are used to what Bob showed you on the left side, I don't know, what was the acronym on the left side, or the name on the left side of that? Social decline. People will just keep blaming everybody else because they're all convinced the other person, it's this guy. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> What this taught me is stop focusing on how to change the other person's behavior. Start with my own belief. 
because here's what I learned. I, like, I, I believe in complexity. The world is complex, nature is complex, you're complex, and I'm complex. But I like simple models that honor the complexity, not simple models that demean the complexity. So here's what I learned. Three basic categories of beliefs. It's really simple. Positive beliefs, neutral beliefs, and negative beliefs. <laughs> beliefs are the root system. You don't have to be a farmer to figure it out. If, if beliefs are the root system, what kind of outcomes or plants will you get from negative beliefs? Negative, negative outcomes. What did you say? Negative plants. Negative plants, which are called weeds. <laughs> By the way, sometimes if you change your beliefs, you see things differently. So the things that we're looking for, employee involvement, employees who speak up and lead, are considered weeds in the old school organization. FYI, dandelions which I was raised to believe are horrible, turn out to make fabulous salad greens and it's great on pasta with little anchovies. Huh? It's true. But my point is you change what you believe, it looks a whole lot different. The things that are considered weeds in old school command control organizations are what we pay people to do. <laughs> We send them to classes to learn how to do what they're fired for in other places. Whoa, this is no joke. No joke. Okay, so on page four in your workbook, here's some things that have been hugely powerful for me. Each one of them is a half-day seminar in its own, so I want to, again, really just focus on getting you thinking. Uh, the newest publication I did is this pamphlet, which is called The Art of Business. I love that Rana is here doing this. Can we have a big hand for Rana? I'm like, this is so great. I'm going to talk about the art of business. And they were so together at POS. They have an artist here already, so I don't even have to barely bring it up. So here's my realization, putting this together with some of my other learnings. Business and life are art, or music, or poetry, or painting whatever you want to pick as your medium. Why? Because I started to realize if you believe you're an artist, <laughs> you will be a whole lot more intentional about everything you do. Because if your life is a painting, then every time you talk to the cashier at the Rite Aid is a brush stroke on the painting of your life. And once it's on the canvas, it ain't coming off. And here's what else I realized. I kind of already knew this, but I never thought about it this way. If we filter out the information that we think is irrelevant and we take in what matters, here's what you all kind of already knew. Visual artists see more. There's no more there. They just see more. Musicians hear more. The sounds are the same, but they're paying way more attention. <laughs> okay. And so I just want to start to encourage people to really look at our lives as we're making amazing art, okay? And part of what makes a great artist is that they bring their soul and their spirit and their passion and their heart, and they put it into play in the universe in a way that's not like everybody else. Because see, here's the deal. Every human being, here's my belief, every human being is a unique, creative, intelligent individual capable of doing great things. Every time we say something that diminishes that uniqueness, it's dehumanizing. So with all due respect to statisticians and there's value in statistics, if you use them as if it's actually true and not the just, a, it's a statistic. It doesn't actually mean the people think that. It just means on that day when they ask that question, with all due respect to how many controls you put in, you can't say women in America think <laughs> blah. Like how can you say that? Like, Jane doesn't even think the same thing she did this morning, probably. She already changed her mind from yesterday's survey. It's just honor the individual. And great art is done by a person who can express their individuality and their creativity. Does this make any sense? Okay, Thelonious Monk said, a genius is a man most like himself. <laughs> Which is easier said than done, but is important. Rollo May, the fascinating psychologist, mid-20th century, said, the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. 
in business doing something special and unique gets a lot of pressure. One of my favorite books the last 10 years is called Ignore Everybody by Hugh McLeod, M-E-C-L-E-O-D, which will tell you that if you do something different, mostly people will tell you it's a bad idea. I have experienced that. <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer from then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, said, all revolutionary ideas go through three stages. Stage one, it's completely impossible, it'll never work. Stage two, it might be possible, but it's not very practical. Stage three, I was behind it from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, people thought when we opened 1982, we were never gonna make it, terrible neighborhood, no parking, bad idea, Ann Arbor won't support a deli. Today, it's like how many people told me they were there the first day we were open, we would have been, been as big as Michigan Stadium. <laughs> I've even got people told me they were there in the late 70s. <laughs> I got a good story, Bob, but I don't have time now. Stop me some other time. Okay, John O'Donohue, amazing guy who somehow I never read until a couple of years ago, philosopher, Irish priest, left the priesthood, theologian, fascinating thinker, uh, passed away about five years ago, I wish that I had known him, said that we are suffering from a crisis of beauty. We're suffering, there's a crisis, an excess of ugliness. Watch the news. Artists put beauty into the world. It's not about mass market, it's each interaction of beauty. And beauty can come in the way you touch your kid's head. Beauty can come in the way you greet the employee. Beauty can come in the way you greet the customer. It comes in every tiny thing, there's a chance to create beauty. And that's the work of the artist, is to create beauty and to see the beauty that was already there <laughs> because we're just not looking. Oscar Wilde said, we're all laying in the same gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Okay, very quick anecdote uh, from James Baldwin about this, and then I'm gonna move on. Y'all know who James Baldwin was, right? Okay, so he said, I remember standing on a street corner with the black painter Beaufort Delaney down in the village waiting for the light to change, and he pointed down and said, look. I looked, and all I saw was the water. And he said, look again, which I did, and I saw oil on the water and the city reflected in the puddle. It was a great revelation to me. I can't explain it. He taught me how to see and how to trust what I saw. Painters have often taught writers how to see. And once you've had that experience, you see differently. So my ask, or one of my asks, or one of the things that's helped me is to go back out in the world and look. Because <laughs> there's beauty everywhere, and we're missing it. And the more we build up the beauty, the less ugliness is in the world. I want to skip down uh, to the second one from the bottom. It's my anarchist right to go not in order. <laughs> it's actually your right. If you want to know how bad hierarchical thinking is, ask people in a room to introduce themselves, and they will always go in order. And usually at the end, I go, why did you go in order? They're like, I don't know. Like, is there any rule that you have to start at one end and go all the way around? No. Why did you go in order? Because they have beliefs that they've learned from the time they were three that if you're good and well-behaved, you go in order. Interesting, because it actually creates zero value <laughs> to the world. I want to jump down to the bottom one. This was a huge, huge revelation for me. It's all work. It's all work. So here's my big turning point of crashing my life. And I started to realize that uh, at work, from the time we got going, like I was doing what y'all do, like reading books about food. And you know, then when we got bigger, I started studying management and like how to get better at all this stuff. But somehow, I don't really know where it came from, but in my childhood, I got the belief that in your personal life, when things were good, they would just flow naturally. <laughs> so if it wasn't flowing naturally and good, then something was wrong, change. Right, and then when I started crashing my life and the pain got high, then I finally, it finally changed my negative beliefs about going to therapy and I started going to therapy and I started to learn all kinds of things and then I started to realize studying myself was as important as studying everything else. <laughs> it's all work. Like, this is like, if you wanna 
like I have like, I should make like a little list of 10 questions that trigger me emotionally. And one of them is like, I say to somebody, I'm going somewhere and they're like, is it for work or is it for fun? <laughs> just ha and I was going to say this anyway, and it just happened yesterday from somebody I like a lot. And I'm like, it's so funny that you said that because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, I try to have fun everywhere and there's nothing I care about that I don't work at. And then people go, well, then it's not work. I'm like, no, it's work. You have negative beliefs about work. I have positive beliefs about work. Good work is rewarding, fulfilling. I wrote a whole essay about it. Good work makes you feel good. Good work brings out your artist. By the way, I don't have little kids, but who has little kids? Isn't it a lot of work? I'm going to leave the curse words out. <laughs> Like, it's work, man. What, do you, I don't play golf. Anybody play golf? I heard you guys talking about it in the back. Who plays golf? Like, isn't it a lot of work? Like, don't you, like, go home and work on your stroke and all that? Like, okay, dude, everything you care about is work. What's wrong with work? The key is to do work you believe in, and it makes a difference, which is what y'all been hearing for two days. If you don't work at it, every part of your life, it's not going to be good. Let's go back to the second one on the page. Here's my other, one of my other big causes. Ready? I really, really dislike the construct of work-life balance. You can use it if you want. I think it's one of the most destructive models that we have presented to people, and it is causing an enormous amount of problems. Wendell Berry wrote a very funny thing, which I'm not going to look up right now, <laughs> about it. He said, basically, it's like we're commuting from life here to work there and then back again. <laughs> Here's my take. It's all one life, y'all. Work-life balance makes it seem like you're working your life or at war, and the best we could get is a truce. <laughs> and by the way, the absence of conflict is not peace. The absence of conflict is not peace. Peace takes work. <laughs> Work-life balance is destructive. What is it? It's all one life. Let me give you what I would suggest is a better model, and I wrote a lot about it in the beliefs book. And by the way, when, I, when this thing blew my mind, the belief cycle, then I did the only thing history majors know how to do, which is study. And then it blew my mind more, and I studied more, and by the way, it turned into a 600-page book, <laughs> which has two chapters on how to build hope in the workplace, going back to what Bob said. Anyways. The model I like is the three sisters. This is agriculture, which most of you won't be familiar with, but an old Native American methodology of agriculture is called the three sisters. It's not monocropping, which is the industrial model where you rip out everything and then plant what you want regardless of where you are. <laughs> this is where you plant corn, beans, and squash as a trio. Why? Because the harvest cycle is different. Each supports the other, et cetera, et cetera. I would suggest when people say work-life balance, what they really mean is their work and their family but they're missing a really important part. What do you think it is? Themselves. themselves. Hello. <laughs> With all due respect to your job and your family, I like them. <laughs> but we have to take care of ourselves also, and it's not a zero-sum game. It's win-win-win. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, it's going to crash. <laughs> Now, if we don't work on the others also, it's also not healthy. But the point is, if one of the three isn't doing great, you still have the other two. But it's not a zero-sum game. And I think the whole point is, I want to be the same person at work as not at work. And when I talk to people who are struggling with the work-life balance, it's like they got to go through detox to go from one to... <laughs> it's not a joke, man. It's like they go through that decompress... What was that movie with the submarines? And then they had to like go through the decompression chamber before they could come back into the air. I don't know if that's still true. But anyway, it's like it's all one life. And people go like, don't you... like?" Don't you want to just relax when you go home? I'm like, dude, I don't know about you, but if I don't like listen to Tammy, active listening, <laughs> it doesn't go well. <laughs> if I don't go the extra mile for people in my life, the relationships suffer. If I don't, it's all what Bob said, it's the same. 
Like, why is it any different? I'm of service everywhere. It's not an act that I do to get y'all to come in and buy a sandwich at the deli. It's a way of life. It's all one thing. Somebody said somebody. It's awesome. Well, it's just what I believe. Okay, I could keep going on all these forever, but let's keep going. The third one on the page, self-management really matters. <laughs> uh, so earlier today I was in the car and I like to make, I wrote an essay on time management, I like to make positive use of all my time. Uh, part of why I live in Ann Arbor is because I don't have to spend a lot of time in the car. I'm from Chicago where like a long drive in Ann Arbor is just like going around the block in rush hour. <laughs> So I, I, I really don't have a lot of time in the car, thankfully, but I was in the car and I called my friend Heather Zara, who some of you may know, she has owns Zara Creative in Detroit. And uh, she goes, oh my God, it's so great that you called. I was just looking at your third book last night. I just, sometimes when I'm stressed out, I just pull out one of your books and I like just open it and I just see what I find. And I'm looking at page 41. Do you remember what's on page 41? I'm like, <laughs> no, I do not remember what's on page 41. <laughs> If you tell me what's on it, I'll remember the page, but I don't remember what's on page 41 on part three of the book. She's like, it's the part where, it's, where you're writing about how business is like a mirror and everything that's happening in your organization is a reflection of what's happening inside you. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of funny because that's what I'm going to talk about. And then she said, and then I started coloring in on the page and like drawing all this stuff. And I'm like, that's really funny because I'm going to talk about art and business and you're doing it. Beauty is all around us. Matisse said there's always flowers for those who choose to see them. So, the management of myself matters. I had very negative beliefs about therapy, kind of common standard American male beliefs about therapy. Only screwed up people would go. <laughs> but then it's like, okay, what if I told you, don't pay any attention to what you eat or work out. If the cardiologist tells you, then okay, start working out. But it might never go wrong, so be overweight. <laughs> Maybe the crisis will never come. <laughs> See, therapy, in hindsight, it's like, why doesn't everybody go? <laughs> so that we don't get to the cardiologist, we don't get to the crisis out of negativity. Let's just start by being shaped, because you need help. Here's a belief about leaders. Strong leaders don't need help. That, dude, that is so wrong. And then... People are like, this is already touched on earlier, but people all the time are like, great leaders don't have fear. They're fearless. I mean, what do you, oh my God, I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid now. <laughs> <laughs> and you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Like, I'm afraid everywhere, all day long. I'm afraid. This is real life. I just learned I needed to go ahead anyway. Like, waiting for the fear to go away was a really long wait. <laughs> But see, if we don't tell the people who work with us that we're afraid, then they, they have the belief that there's something wrong with them because they're afraid. And clearly, we're brave and not. It's like, dude, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to deal with customer complaints. I'm afraid to deal with difficult employees. I'm afraid to give a raise because they might want a bigger raise. I'm afraid. I'm just afraid. But it's okay to be afraid. But when I started going to therapy, I... Uh, I remember Richard Kempter was my therapist, really great guy. Some of you might know him. He moved to New York a few years ago. Anyway, you know, and he goes, how do you feel? And I was like, fine. <laughs> and he goes, fine is not a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say more? I'm, I'm really anxious. <laughs> he goes, that's not a feeling either. <laughs> fine, by the way. I, I'm not in AA, and I don't have a substance abuse problem, but I just... If you, I've read the big book, and uh, when I read it, I was like, I don't have a substance abuse problem, but I got all the problems that they're talking about in this book. <laughs> but anyway, in the AA community, fine has, is an acronym. Fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> okay? Now, to understand, like, if emotional intelligence is important and self-awareness is important in business, duh, like not having a vocabulary around emotion, like how can you function? And I realized today when I was out running, I'm like, it's like you went to the banker to get a loan and they said, how's your finances? And you said, fine. <laughs> and, you, and they said, can you say a little more? And you said, I'm a little anxious. 
Like it's so stupid, you wouldn't even imagine, dream of doing that. But we show up in business managing human beings that are loaded up with emotion, and we don't know how to say anything better than I'm fine, I'm worried, or maybe I'm mad. Think about it. Okay. Number four on the page, free choice. I'm going to talk more about this of anarchism. It's all free choice. This freed me enormously. Once I who here says the phrase, uses the phrase, I have to? Who says that? Only a, come, really. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> when you say that you have to, I used to say it all the time, where's the power? Somewhere else. How about this phrase, I should? Who says that? Only about an hour down to 20%. Okay. How about this one? I can't. Where's the power? Y'all, you're giving away your power. How do I know? Because I did it. Because here's the thing. You don't have to do anything. I could walk out of here, never go home again, never go back to work, zero. And I'm not talking about money and freedom because I have a big savings account. I'm talking about you don't have to go to work. You may choose to go to work. You don't have to be nice to anybody. You may choose to be nice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Edward Carpenter, very interesting, late 19th century English anarchist you never heard of, said, to live under the continual compulsion of others is to be a slave, not to live. Choose. It's all a choice. This is so powerful. This changed my energy drastically when I realized this. It's all a choice. By the way, I'm a total introvert, and I'm very shy. Once I realized this, I stopped going to parties. <laughs> the extroverts are like, he can't be an introvert. How can he be up there? And the introverts are like, dude, I'm not going to go anywhere either. <laughs> Do what you want, but the point is it's a choice. I'm not saying don't do difficult things, but it's a choice. It's a choice. My energy increased drastically when I realized I owned the choices. They were my choices to make. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go to work. I don't have to be nice. Who remembers their parents telling them they have to do something? Okay, how did you feel? Okay, so all day long, hello, your employees are saying to themselves or their significant other or you, I have to go to work now. They're better at hiding it, but inside they feel just like you did when you were eight and your mom told you you had to clean your room. If you get them to own their choices, their energy is going to go up either. They don't have to work with us. It's a choice. They may have pressures. I'm not doubting the difficulties of life, et cetera, et cetera. It's still a choice. Read Edith, Edith Ava Ager's book, The Choice. And by the way, the only major difference between a forced march and a marathon is free choice. Because in both of them, you feel like you're going to fall over. But in one, you push through of your own volition, and the other one, you go as slow as possible in order to not get shot. This is no joke. Okay. Bottom one on the page, visioning. Uh, Wayne, a lot of you already know, I mean, I could do two days and then I still got two more days that aren't even in the two day Zinc Train seminar, which is coming up, I think, in June. This process changed my life. I wrote about it in the books. If you don't know where you're going, what's likely to happen? Well, you go somewhere. I mean, it just may not be where you want to go. The reason that I have vocation is not because I just stumbled on my passion, with all due respect to finding your passion. I know everybody's getting told to find their passion, but then what's happening is they're like, there's something wrong with me. I don't know what my passion is. So then they're like trying everything, and it's like that book, Are You My Mother? And they're all... <laughs> and then they spend two days in everything, and it's like, Passion is partly what you're interested in, but it's also it's just as much how much work you put into it and derive purpose and all the joy and all the other things y'all been hearing about. So they're like, is coffee my passion? Oh, I tried it for a week. No. <laughs> it's not going to come. The visioning process, I'm not enough time to get into it now, but it's a process of tapping what's already in here because what, what did you call them? The un told stories or something? There's a subliminal stuff that, okay, in your heart, and I know this the hard way because I buried it for a lot of years. In your heart, you already know the answer. And if you write a vision, the way we write vision, and a lot of you know, if you write a vision. See, if you say you're going to be a teacher or you're a professor or you're an engineer 
or you're even you're a positive organizational scholarship expert. You're still one of many. <laughs> but no two teachers are the same. So when you write a vision the way we do it, which could be three, four, five, eight pages long, it's a description of the story of your life that you write. It's an inside-out exercise with all due respect. It requires no analytics, no studies. And it's not your mother's, your professor's, your boss's, your husband, your wife, your kid's version. It's yours. And when you write it, you're one of one because there is no one in the world unless they downloaded your vision <laughs> and copied it. There is no one in the world that will write the vision the way you do, and that honors the humanity instead of demeaning the humanity. Okay? The last thing I want to go over, and then I'll wrap up, and then at 4.50, well, about 4.20, there's a woman from the Labadee collection. Oh, there she is. Say hi. She's going to lead you over to the collection if you don't know where it is, and I'm going to go sign books. But anyway, I want to leave you with one tangible tool because mostly I've given you questions, but this is something else that changed my life a lot, which is on the next page, which is energy management. Okay? Uh, I learned this from Anise Kavanaugh, A-N-E-S-E, Kavanaugh with a C. She'll probably end up speaking here one of these years. Uh, she's great. I just wrote the forward for her next book. We adapted this from her. I give her total credit like I give credit for the visioning to Ron Lippitt and all the other people that have done great work from whom we have learned in our wonderful ecosystem of Ann Arbor, which I love deeply. Uh, we made positive energy a job expectation at Zingerman's. <laughs> so if you're in HR, it's a performance problem <laughs> when you don't have it. Just saying. Whom, who's responsible for each of our energy? So I'm not a science person, I'm a history major, but I know enough to know if I throw something at the wall, what will happen? It will bounce back. And if I throw it harder, what will happen? It comes back harder. So I had a really nice little coaching moment at the Roadhouse last night with a new supervisor who's trying super hard and doing a really good job, but his energy was like really too fast. And I'm like, dude, slow down. Now, this is counterintuitive when it's super busy and you feel like you've got to move faster, but it's actually bad energy. Okay, so we teach this to everybody. I'm going to teach it to you because even if your boss, like Bob said, it totally sucks. <laughs> By the way, Peter Block, if you look up, I love him and we have known him and I write about his stuff. But anyway, this is a very good, I wish I could tell you what it is, but this is a very good YouTube talk with him. And he goes, like, every talk I give, you'll appreciate this. He goes, I give the talk. It's all about great you know, leadership, all the things you're hearing about here. He goes, I get in the elevator afterwards, three, four people pile in the elevator with me, and they're like, that talk was fabulous. you got to talk to my boss. <laughs> and he goes, it's the belief cycle. He goes, why are you making a boss for yourself like that? Because the self-fulfilling belief cycle is not hierarchically connected to anything. And when we're all in the dance together, we just go around and around together. Anyway, we're all responsible for our own energy. Three elements of energy, because you can start practicing this as soon as you leave here. And by the way, it works at home too. Because it's all one life. The first two are not shocking. Very quickly, how would you manage, what would you do to manage your physical energy to be effective? Sleep is good. What else? Exercise, eating well, not a hard one for me, but a lot of people in the world don't have access to healthful food. It is almost impossible to feel really good if you don't eat healthfully. Exercise, I run every day, literally every day. Next week, I'm going to be four years without missing a day. Because, look, yeah, people are like, people are like, you know, no, whatever, like, anybody could do it. People are like, you don't run into winter too, do you? I'm like, yeah, like when it's really cold. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do it? I'm like, I go out. <laughs> it's not that hard. I'm super slow. I don't go run races. I'm an afternoon runner. I'm an anarchist, introvert. I don't want to run with any of you. Thank you. I like you all. <laughs> don't offer. <laughs> Let's, let me save time. <laughs> it's not personal. I just don't want to see you while I run. Okay. So yeah, all of those things, very good. We're in an academic setting. There's lots of studies coming out showing learning skills being correlated with exercise. By the way, I hated gym when I was in high school, but all these studies are showing is used to treat autism now, learning disabilities, et cetera. 
Uh, hydration, also important. Second one, you also know emotional energy. You could also call it intellectual or spiritual or mental energy. What would you do to manage that? Meditate. Visualize. That's visioning, absolutely. Yeah, I stopped. No, I'm, I'm like a three newspaper a day person, religiously reading the news. I don't even look anymore. Why? Because everything we do and everything y'all are learning here is 180 degrees the opposite of what they're doing. I believe they mean the best, but they're not doing too good. So the more I read it, it poisons me. One of the best ways to have positive emotional energy is to hang around with the right people. If you hang with negative people, it's very hard to stay positive. It doesn't make them bad people. They're good people. They're just stuck in a bad loop. They got a lot of negative beliefs, and there's a lot of weeds in the ecosystem. They don't just go away in a day. Okay, so hanging with the right people, that's part of why y'all feel better when you're here, because look where you are. <laughs> Everybody's positive. It's so much more fun. But for me, honestly, this is when I go to work. Most days, this is what it's like. We got problems too. It's just people can deal with them in a positive and healthy way. By the way, we got a whole initiative at the Roadhouse over the last year and a half that's making a really big difference, which is to eliminate drama. And we're teaching it, and it's, it's actually working. <laughs> Not as fast as I ever want, but it's, but, it's, but it's working. Okay, here's a really big one, is learning is a big piece of emotional energy. The act of learning makes an enormous difference. The third one, which is the one that blew my mind, is vibrational energy. This is what people take from you. It's not what you think you're doing, it's what everybody else thinks you're doing. You all know people in your lives that have negative vibrational energy. You all know people that have positive vibrational energy. We've all had negative vibrational energy, and we all have had positive vibrational energy. It's work to manage it. There's quickly some things that help you. Breathing, which was the first thing I told my colleague at the Roadhouse last night. I put my hand on, my on his shoulder and I said, stop, breathe. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I have a little thing, SBA, stop, breathe, appreciate in 15 seconds your energy guaranteed to change 180 degrees. Okay, I've written a lot about this. It's in the second book. The point is, CEO, to me, ought to mean chief energy officer. Why? Because where does the energy in the organization start? Yeah. We can manage it, okay? Uh, the Dalai Lama said we can never have peace in the world until we make peace with ourselves. So you can, people can keep arguing about who's in power and they can keep being pissed off at political parties, but at the end of the day, it starts with me and it starts with the art that I bring to every interaction that I have, okay? At the bottom of the page, a very simple energy, uh, recipe. Read it, we use a zero to 10 scale, zero sucks, 10 is great. Vision it where you want it to be. Manage it because each of us needs to self-manage. I'm a total introvert, so I want to get away from y'all. So half of you are extroverts. You're like, oh, let's go hang out at the bar and have a drink afterwards. By the way, I'll be at the roadhouse tonight pouring water, working the floor if you want to see more of me in my introverted, extrovert form. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth step is to repeat it because through all the day, weird things are going to happen. Now, if we were in a longer session, we were running a marathon, not a sprint, I would pause for a lot of questions, but we're not going to. So I want to wrap up, and then I'll go out there. Uh, one of the things of self-management, one of the things of dealing with awareness in the world in a real and meaningful way, one of the things of owning emotions and having emotions is that it also means dealing through the difficult times. So, uh, and I have come to realize that as painful and difficult as hard things are, like when I crashed my life, good things come out of it if you do the work, because it's all work. So this last story, and I'll read you this little bit and I'll get out of the way. Uh, so I had a really good friend named Daphne Zappos, who was from Greece, and we became really great friends over the years, and she worked in the food world, and she worked with cheese, and we really uh, became great friends. We traveled many countries together, really some great stories, and she had this long-time ambition, she lived in San Francisco, to buy this little thing called the Cheese School of San Francisco that this woman had started, and, but wasn't that into what she was doing, and Daphne was like, I wanna buy this because she loved cheese education, and so she kept talking about it, and finally uh, in September, I think it'll be nine years ago this year, uh, she bought it. 
and it was great, right? So then in January, I was out there as I am pretty much every year for the fancy food show. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I'm so busy, but like, I really ought to go to one of Daphne's classes. It would be terrible if I came all the way here and I didn't go to one of the classes in her little school. So on Sunday, you know, long day at the food show, get my run in. I'm kind of tired, but I'm like, all right, I'm going to go. So I go and I get to this class. It's on Dutch cheese and I get, I know the woman who's teaching it, but I go anyway and I get to the class and I'm like 10 minutes late and I look down the row and there's only like 20 people in the class and there's this blonde woman with really short hair and you know, like number of vocations, like falling in love and it works out, <laughs> but who's been on a first date where you thought it was going to work out? <laughs> only nine of you. <laughs> Very interesting audience. Okay, <laughs> who's been on a first date where you thought it was gonna work out? Okay, but it didn't, <laughs> okay. But anyway, I had that feeling. So there's this woman in the class and then we start talking at the end and we get to know each other. We, everybody else in the group are extroverts and they're all going out together and we're like, no, we're gonna go talk. And we do, and we go have really bad wine in North Beach together, but we have like a three hour conversation and you know, whatever, eight and a half years later, we're still together and she lives here now and it's really great. But anyways, uh, that was in January. At the end of March, Daphne was diagnosed with lung cancer. Three months later, she was dead. Okay, so it's this weird thing and maybe I'm just making it up and it's my belief, but I try to find the beauty in each of it. So it's like Daphne's gift to me was Tammy. And I've spent a lot of my food life, which I also speak about, not business, is to go into people's homes, like in the mountains and whatever, and they don't write recipes in the mountains <laughs> for their food, even though y'all want recipes in the cookbooks that tell you exactly what to do, like they don't cook like that. <laughs> so, but I've spent a lot of years going up there and I could kind of figure out, like, that's, I watch what they do and then I can like translate it into a recipe that Americans who don't cook every day can figure out what to do. And so I want to close with, with really what my interpretation, because she never really wrote much, what Daphne's recipe for a good life would be, because that was my charge from Chris. So she never put it in these words, but this is what I extract from her conversations, which we had a lot of. Find something you're passionate about and then give yourself to it. Find people you're passionate about and then give yourself to them. Don't give in to demands to live in a way that's out of sync with yourself. Study with passion and learn like crazy. Travel widely and mindfully to where you want to go and need to go. Embrace your feelings and share them freely and joyfully with the world. Laugh a lot, especially with those you love. Believe in anything big you do or don't bother doing it. Always hope for the best and have fun in the process. Be generous of spirit and everything else. Bring love, passion, poetry, and the flavor of great cheese, figuratively if not literally, to everything you do and own your life. And I'll just read you this last bit. While I was working on this essay, extracting the epilogue of the book from an ending I never dreamed of, which was Daphne's death, nor desired to write, I came across a note Daphne had sent me many years ago. The last line stopped me cold, stunned me really with its simplicity and with her exceptional ability to say what it is in a wonderful, if in hindsight, chillingly sad sort of way. At the end of an otherwise unimportant email, she wrote, I never see you enough. There's always so much more to say. Someday when you taste a particularly great piece of cheese or when you're surrounded by good friends or when you start to doubt yourself and you feel you've lost your way, I hope you'll think of Daphne or the Daphne's in your life. Don't dally, life is short. Live it well, going for greatness throughout, sharing thoughts and feelings, liberally and lovingly with family and friends. There is always so much more to say. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to do a quick close. We know that some of you have places to get to. Uh, this has been an amazing two days. Um, 
We've co-created this together. Just want to acknowledge our beginning of thinking about this being more of a gathering uh, rather than a, a traditional or default conference. And so I think we created for ourselves something pretty special, something beautiful, to use Ari's word, uh, in our uh, gathering together. Okay, so we want to say some thank yous. To begin with, uh, there are a lot of staff that made this possible. There's a whole bunch of people in the booth behind here. We have staffers in the room. Please stand up. Kelly, stand up. Others who have helped. Rana, over here. Thank you. We want to thank Chris White, who uh, headed up the content team. Jerry Davis, the Associate Dean for Impact here at Ross. Angie is hiding someplace. Please say thank you to Angie. We had, we had 31 speakers present to you. I want to say thank you to all those speakers, those in the room, those who are outside the room. I want to thank you, Chris. You've been a great co MC. Thank you. <laughs> We've gone past the slide, but next year's conference is May 14th, 2020. Encourage you to consider adding that to your calendar now. And between now and then, uh, we have uh, YouTube videos of all of the speakers. And so please feel free to go to those, share those on social media, spread the word. And also, as we said before, Rana's beautiful uh, art pieces uh, will be uh, digitized. <laughs> And you'll find those on the conference website. So spread the word, spread, spread the positivity, and let's all join together again next year in 2020. So we have a, a special piece for you here to um, kind of celebrate the ending of our time together. This is a tradition for us. And so you know that our, our photographer has been taking lots and lots of photographs, and we've compiled them into a video, a short video, uh, to just give you a, kind of a embodied sense of what we've experienced together. So our, my task is, our task is for you to watch the video and at the end, if, I, if you could just rise and give all of ourselves a standing ovation for our time together, okay? Thank you.
Safe journey is home. Great job.